<laughs> pretty much like last year's roster. <laughs> um, you know, look, we're still young. Um, I think it's a roster that you know still has some upside to it. You know, because of the age. You know, we were we're the second youngest team in the league again this year. Um, we're the youngest team in the playoffs the last two years. So, you know, I think we're expecting a lot of internal growth, Jace. Um, we got a healthy Ed Davis. You know, we're hoping to see Myers bounce back from a tough year. Um, some of the younger guys that really hadn't had much of an opportunity the last couple of years because of the depth um, have had really good summers. Um, so we'll see where they can contribute. Um, and you know, a lot of it's going to be the cohesion of keeping the group together. So it'll be it'll be an, it'll be an interesting season to see what kind of a leap guys make on an individual basis, and does that impact how we play as a team? Well, you know, look, I think we've been consistent. I mean, we, we liked our team. You know, we liked the, you know, the path we were on um, because of the age of the roster and because of the long-term, you know, salary commitments we'd made, we had a long runway with this group. But, look, clearly the West got incredibly competitive, right? We have one all-star leave, three come in, um, one switch teams. And, you know, look, we, we tried to keep up in the arms race as best we could. Um, you know, we made every effort. Um, in some of those, you know, circumstances, most of the – the movement was by trade. And you know you need willing partners when it comes to trades. And I can tell you we were incredibly aggressive. Uh, we protected certain pieces of our roster that we felt were irreplaceable. Um, and you know, I don't like to talk about you know, what, what things that could have been, but like I said, we, we, we did everything in our power to try and accelerate where we're trying to get to as a team. And you know, in terms of trade, it didn't work out. So, um, but like I said, we didn't give anything up either in terms of the future of the roster that we continue to build. So look, does it, it puts more pressure on player development. Um, it puts more pressure on player growth because we're not getting as much help from the outside uh, that we would have liked had we been able to make a trade. But you know, things aren't over yet. We've got the biggest trade exception in the league. You know, we're, we're still aggressive. Um, you know, I think back in February, who would have thought the impact that Yusuf Nurkic would have had? And that's not an excuse for not getting things done with some of the higher profile guys that were on the market this summer. But, you know, not every answer is the simple answer of the highest profile guy is someone you have to go after and go get because a lot of teams had tools. A lot of teams realized we were trying to keep up with Golden State as best we could. And, you know, we weren't the only team that didn't end up with those guys. So we can talk about the three that came. You know, there were 27 other teams in the league that didn't get those guys either. I couldn't hear you, Joe. How, how do you think this roster fits in the getting so Well, I, look, I'm not going to put, you know, win totals or projections or potential playoff seedings. You know, hopefully, look, we always shoot for the same thing. You know, we want to be, we want to continue to have a sustainable roster. Um, you know, we want to go into the playoffs where we have the ability to be a factor in the playoffs. And like I said, it got tougher. But at the end of the day, once you're in the playoffs, only eight teams are making it anyway. So, you know, I think the first step is to be a playoff team. I mean, we're looking at, um, you know, multiple teams that were on the outside looking in last year that made big additions. So I think the number of teams competing for those eight spots grew. Um, and even if you look at the bottom of the West, we have, you know, really young, talented teams that are going to be a threat to win games. So, um, you know, I don't want to talk about the other conference, but clearly, you know, I wouldn't mind shifting over to Portland, Maine for the next seven months. How much emphasis has there been or will there be on getting off to a faster start? Well, you know, I, I think there are a lot of extenuating circumstances when you talk about fast starts. I mean, it's not necessarily always in your control. I mean, the schedule has a lot to do with it. You know, player health has a lot to do with it. Um, I do think the consistency on the roster, the fact that our guys were together all summer, um, that the core of the roster has stayed the same, hopefully gives us an advantage. Um, you know, like I said, we've got to make up for the fact that um, you know, we didn't make a big impact addition this offseason that we can rely on to give that kind of a burst. But you know, I think we have to build off of how we finished the season. Uh, we're not going to extrapolate that over 82 games, but clearly it was a positive indicator of what the roster is capable of when it's, when it's fully formed and everyone's healthy. And, you know, like I said, when you start fast start, slow start, I mean, there's times when the, fa the schedule's more favorable the first 20 games than it is the last 20. And, you know, that's, that's something we're going to have to look at. But I, I do think the players realize that the last two years, we dug a hole for ourselves we had to dig our way out of. And I think they're cognizant of that. And, 
you know, their off-season efforts, you know, kind of indicate they know we've got to get off on the right foot. Um, you know, we were involved. He was great. You know, he went home for a little while. He came back. Um, he spent most of it. He, he stayed longer. Uh, then he left. He spent most of July with us into early August. Um, Nate Tibbetts went overseas, you know, and visited with him over there. He was one of the first guys back. He came back prior to Labor Day. So, you know, I think, our, I think Todd Forcier and Ben Kenyon did a great job. Um, he's been really diligent about his nutrition, uh, which has been impressive. Um, I think he realized, you know, he's got to play longer stretches. Um, he's quicker. I, I think his stamina is going to be better. Um, you know, and, you know, he's still a young player. I mean, young players and young bigs, you know, grow at different rates. So I think from a maturity standpoint about how he approached his physicality this offseason was a combination, you know, of his determination, and then we just provided the resources. Yeah, of course. I mean, look, and that's, look, that's where this league is trending, right? At the end of the day, we can talk all we want about GMs recruiting players or coaches, but, you know, it's a small, small world, you know, through social media, you know, Team USA, guys playing pickup together in the summers, and, you know, guys have decided that the best way to try and build rosters is to try and get guys to join them. So um, I've always been a general manager that solicits players' opinions. I respect players' opinions. At the end of the day, we do what's best for the organization, but they're the ones that play with and against these guys. So in my opinion, they sometimes have the best feel for who can make an impact to our roster. So they were well aware of what we tried to do. They were on top of it. Things that didn't work out, they're well aware of why they didn't work out and totally comfortable with it. But they also, they also believe in this roster and believe in what it's capable of. I mean, you know, as Dame has said when you know, people attack him on Twitter, I've been in the playoffs four straight years. There aren't a lot of teams that can say that. So, and it's been with different iterations of the roster with turnover and the youngest roster in the league the last two years. So, you know, I think, look, it's important that they do want to accelerate this because we all want to win and we want to as quickly as possible. There's just certain realities to building a roster that you have to face and it didn't come to fruition at this point so far. You know, I don't know that that's fair. Um, I, I think there are extenuating circumstances in each situation. You know, I, I think we're in a rare time in the league that will basically come back to the mean at some point, which is we've had a, a preponderance of cap room across the league. You know, normally teams, you know, strategically plan to have cap room. There's a limited marketplace. You're competing against three or four or five teams. With the spike in the cap that we all faced, you know, from 70 to 93, 93 to 99, it opened the door for a lot of teams that maybe weren't planning on having cap room, having more. So they had the ability to have built their roster, right, where they thought they were done and that was a roster that was going to have to grow, and they were gifted cap room. So I think once that reconciles itself again over the next year or two, we'll be back to planning for cap room based on the players. Um, you know, I do think, look, we are, we're not a place that guys that aren't from here spend a lot of time. So getting players comfortable with Portland is tough because other than perhaps a visit to Nike or Adidas when they're rookies to do a shoe deal, it's not a destin an off-season destination. Players go to LA to work out, they go to Houston, they go to New York, they go to different places to play pickup, to train, you know what I mean? So even our players, I mean look, Myers Leonard spent the summer in Los Angeles, CJ spent a lot of time in New York. So I think getting players comfortable with what a great city this is beyond the organization and our fan base is a longer term process. It's why we put such an emphasis on player retention because the guys that are here are happy being here and it's why you know for us draft and trade are so they're, they're so important to this because we've got to keep our guys here because they're the guys that see the city for what it is and they buy into it and they buy into the lifestyle and the culture and the value of the organization and how they're treated, it's very hard to sell that as anything other than rhetoric to guys from the outside looking to come in. Well, I think we have to continue to build the roster. Um, you know, I think it's some players want to play with great players. You know, we have, we have some great players on this roster. Um, they're also young guys. You know, I mean, we look at them because they've been here. 
But at the end of the day, C.J. McCollum's just coming off what year one of his rookie scale, right? This is the, he was on a rookie scale last year. You know, Dame's second year of his contract extension. So, you know, I think the higher profile that our star players have, um, I think players gravitate there. I went through this with the Clippers where, you know, we couldn't get free agents. We weren't on the list, the short list of places guys wanted to get traded to. We were lucky enough to draft a young superstar. It raised the profile of the organization, and that opened the door to incremental growth with free agents. It, it, it opened the door to more success on the floor, and combined with market, allowed us to become a destination. And I think that's what we have to do here, is continue to build the roster. I mean, clearly, you know, one of the players we're talking about, without bringing up names, went to another small market team. So they, they've done a great job there. They've had success. They built the roster. Um, they had the assets that they were willing to convey to acquire the player. And that's the position we have to put ourselves in. Do you think when a guy like Dame doesn't make the All-Star team a couple years in a row, that that is any kind of detriment to your I do. Um, because from a basketball perspective, there's no reason in the world Damian Lillard did not make the All-Star team the last two years. Not one. And I think myself and I think Terry have been incredibly vocal about that. Um, what he did on the court, what he does for this organization, um, there's no reason he should have been left off those All-Star teams. But you know, for whatever reasons, you know, he was. And honestly, it ended up benefiting us because at both times he had better second half of the years than he did the first half. You know, we went to the second round of the playoffs. The first year he was left off, he became an all second team NBA player. So clearly it wasn't, you know, it wasn't as misguided as you would have thought because 22 games later, he ended up making the second team all NBA. Um, last year, he turned his season around. He averaged 30 points a game after the all-star snub. And basically, you know, along with, you know, adding Nurk and other guys stepping up, led us back to the playoffs for the fourth consecutive year. So, you know, there's a give and take with it. I know Dame likes playing with a chip on his shoulder, but I, I also think, you know, he carries that chip with him. Um, but I do think the perception of that has something to do with it. And I think we've seen some players make decisions where they may be in a conference where, <coughs> part of me, it's easier to make an all-star team. And look, all of us that have kids, from the time they're eight and trying to make Little League, they want to be on the All-Stars, right? And it doesn't change at this level. You know, look, I think one of the things that's positive about the depth is the versatility of Evan Turner. You know, we brought, we signed Evan last year because he is a Swiss Army knife. He can play multiple positions. He can guard multiple positions. Um, we've been really happy with how Shabazz has looked this offseason. Um, he's one of the guys that have, have shown some growth. You know, we forget he's still a young guy on a rookie scale. So um, he's had a nice offseason. And, um, you know, look, we've got, we've got, you know, arguably the best, if not the second best backcourt in the NBA. So, you know, it's not like you're going to have a third guy there as well. But, you know, we like the fact that we've got versatility back there. Damon CJ can play multiple spots. Evan can play three positions. Like I said, Shabazz has, he finished the season strong last year and he's had a really nice off season. So, so that's a positive. Neil, I know you won't go into details, but can you uh, elaborate on how your approach even compared to just the contract situation? Yes, I can't elaborate. I, I mean, look, we've sat here each year, we've had guys up for extensions. Um, we, haven't, we haven't discussed those publicly. What I would say is he's a, a key piece to the future of this team, but we don't discuss contract negotiations. Um, and, you know, one thing to remember, you know, we've done a couple of contract extensions, you know, for Damon and CJ, but we've also had guys that we've kept. Um, you know, we didn't do extensions with Mo and Myers, but they were, you know, initial orders of business once we reached the offseason when they became restricted, we got those deals done. AC was a restricted free agent, you know, his offer sheet got matched. So, you know, you know, we get caught up in extensions. At the end of the day, there weren't a lot of extensions done. I mean, look at the number of extensions done last year. I think, I think only CJ, I think it was CJ, Giannis, Victor, Stephen Adams, and Rudy Gobert were the only guys that had extensions done out of that rookie class. So, you know, it's not like there's, um, you know, a cutoff. I mean, you know, if an extension gets done, it gets done. If not, you just shift your focus to July 1st. Terry, are we calling it the G League? <laughs> Terry and I are old school. We're not afraid of development. Um, 
You know, uh, look, we signed C.J. Wilcox to a two-way. Um, you know, we, we, we like C.J. Um, you know, he, he brings something to the table, you know, in terms of shooting the ball. Um, we think he's another young guy that, you know, maybe hasn't found the right situation to this point in his career. And, you know, we're going to take a look at how the two-way contract works using a different partnership. Um, you know, we don't have our team, but we have good relationships with other D-League teams where, you know, they, they would be happy to have our guys. So um, I think C.J. is going to be a foray into that. And, you know, we're continuing to look at the viability of having a franchise you know, the key, uh, Jason, in all honesty, is where to put the franchise. You know, where, where, where is it viable from a business standpoint, and where can we maximize it from a basketball standpoint? Well, look, I think that's better a question for Terry, but I do think, you know, in trading AC, what it did was open up minutes at the three, and I think when you look at the guys that potentially could play there, um, they're clearly capable of filling the hole from a defensive standpoint. Um, I also think the two young guys we drafted, um, they're gonna have to fight for playing time because nothing's given, but they are defensive-oriented players. I mean, they're both two-way players, but I think they can make impacts on the defensive side of the ball. Um, and then I think guys realize that when we made a jump at the end of the year, it wasn't just our offense. I mean, guys got dialed in defensively. I don't have the rankings in front of me, but you know, from a defensive efficiency standpoint, having a presence in the paint like Nurk, getting back a healthy Ed Davis, um, who's an elite you know, defensive player at both the four and the five, um, is gonna help. Um, you know, we had Farouk hurt for probably 20 games last year. I don't have the exact number, but he missed a good part of the time, who's our best defender. And I think we found something late in the year where Evan, started matching more at different positions on the floor defensively, and that was an impact move for us. So, like I said, I think it's probably more of a, you know, from a team standpoint, a, a question for Terry, but I think, you know, when you look at the guys on the roster, they're all capable of playing, you know, higher level defense, um, and that should result in, you know, a higher defensive efficiency for the team. Yeah, I mean, look, two different summer league experiences. You know, Zach got hurt in summer league practice. Um, he hadn't done any competitive draft workouts, so you know, he was a little bit behind the curve. But I think, you know, his summer, he was better at Gerg's camp than he was in summer league. He's been very, very good since he got here. He's a 19-year-old big. Um, you know, clearly we've got, you know, we've got Yusuf Nurkic, we've got Ed, we've got Myers, Farouk plays some four. I mean, you know, Caleb can play both positions. Noah played a lot of small five last year, but. You know, look, the draft is about building for the future. Um, I think one of the things that we've been pleased with, and the coaches get a lot of credit for this because their ability to develop players without them actually getting significant playing time, is that we, we may have had a front-loaded roster in terms of minutes played, but behind the scenes, we were developing our young players. And I think Caleb and Zach are both in that position. They'll have an opportunity to fight for playing time, but their growth and development will not just happen on the court with, with game minutes. It's going to happen every day before practice, after practice, game simulation, going up against our guys so that they can grow. You know, you, I mean, C.J. McCollum didn't wake up one day and suddenly become a guy that can get you 35 in an NBA playoff game against the Memphis Grizzlies. I mean, that was a process. Alan Crabb grew. You know, he got on the floor, ironically, Alan Crabb got on the floor because of his, his ability to defend. Which, which distinguished him between the other young guys in the roster, and he grew into a 44% a three-point shooter. So, look, both guys, we're really high on both. They both have great futures with us, um, but they're going to have to compete for minutes because there's definitely incumbents ahead of them, and they're both workers, which is really critical to this because we wouldn't have drafted them if they weren't. I mean, they're not plug-and-place guys. These are guys that are going to have to come in, earn their stripes, work, be ready if given the opportunity, but understand that a lot of their development is going to be at, you know, the practice facility. You know, look, we have this conversation every year. Um, you know, we do. I mean, look, and I say this to Myers' face. I mean, you know, look, every year, you know, Myers does what he needs to do in the offseason. I mean, he really does. And, you know, I think, look, we go with the narrative that, you know, bigs take longer, but you know, Myers was behind the curve. He's young. He's gotten beat out multiple times by guys coming in. Um, you know, I think now it's very clear that any minutes at center are backup center minutes behind Nurk. So I think that can take some of the pressure off of him, that he doesn't feel like he has to be a franchise center. 
Um, he, he has looked good. I mean, in the pickup games, he's been more aggressive. Um, his instincts have been better. He's shooting the ball well. He's been more willing to absorb contact. But at the end of the day, he's going to have to put it, he's going to have to do it on the court because, you know, at some point, it, it is still about development, but it's about production. And I think Myers knows that. And his commitment in the offseason has put him in a position where he's ready to compete. Now he just needs to prove to the coaches he can get it done and they can have his trust when he gets on the court. Yeah, I, look, I, you know, I, I think our players last year, you know, made a statement. Um, they have 100% our support, you know, whatever statement that, that takes, whatever form that takes. You know, last year, you know, we, we were prepared for this. You know, the NFL led the way, you know, in early September. And by the time we got to camp, uh, a platform had been established that our players clearly wanted to participate in. And we supported them 100%. We talked about it, you know, as a team. I mean, I think one of the things that you'll know about all of us is, you know, we, we walk together, you know, arm in arm, and it's not just symbolic. I mean, the discussions happen, you know, at the practice facility, and, you know, all of our, you know, our leaders on this roster knew whatever we were going to do was as a team. Um, you know, I think, you know, on a, to, to answer your question about, you know, President Trump's comments, I think, you know, it's obvious to everyone right now, we're, you know, we're amidst some turbulent and divisive times in our country, both, you know, domestically and internationally, and I think, Anything that brings attention to that to the forefront, be it verbal, be it symbolic through social media, um, is a positive movement toward change. But I do think that at some point, that message is going to reach critical mass. And I think what, what's crucial is that once it reaches that point where we've maxed out the messaging aspect of this, we've got to turn our attention to solutions. You know, we're, we're all aware now of the issues with racial inequality and injustice, and I think the players are doing an outstanding job of bringing that through the symbolism with what they're doing pregame, you know, and what they're doing through social media and speaking out, and the responsibility they're taking is outstanding, but I also believe that we're going to reach a point where the message only goes so far, and I think we need to turn our attention to finding solutions that unite our country instead of things that divide it further. Yeah, there, there is, you know, but it's interesting. I think it's more reserved this year. Um, you know, Terry can speak to, I think guys expect to be good now. You know, I, I mean, we went on this Cinderella run, you know, two years ago, you know, uh, Mace had a phenomenal run and, you know, we kind of caught lightning in a bottle and, you know, when we advanced further than anybody thought. And I think that spiked expectations. And I do think that guys went in thinking, Things could be given and not earned to a certain degree. You know, I think we took it for granted, and the West got tougher. You know, the, the Western Conference we faced last year in September was a much different conference than the one we faced in, in March and April. And I think we're facing it again. I think one of the positives of such great players moving into the Western Conference is that it's obvious to everyone on this roster that we need to step up our game from day one. So guys have been dialed in more. I think, you know, you notice one of the things we talked about, um, you know, Dame didn't do his, his workout in San Diego because it, this was about locking in. This wasn't about bonding off the court, going to a Padres game, getting workouts. And this was about getting back to Portland as quick as possible, getting in the gym and getting to work. And I think they've got much more of a work-based effort towards what we need to do this season than a camaraderie-based effort because – that's been established. Any other questions? Okay. Ready up? Thanks, guys. Thank